Bow, bow your head and pray with me. And as we pray, direct our attention to the word, as we think about what we've just sung, I want to pray Psalm 24 about the king of glory, especially because we are going to be studying the king, coming kingdom of Christ this morning. Lord, it's such a privilege to worship with your people, and we've come to worship you. We, we, we can only, we can only uh, imagine in light of your word, in light of the prophecy of truth about what we will look like when we are glorified and what sinless worship will look like, we can only imagine how, how sweet that will be on that final day to be part of worship that will be un tinged, unmixed, uncontaminated with sin. To give you a worship that would be worthy of your name simply because you have produced it. You have purchased it and you will produce it and you are producing it in us. And so we're just overwhelmed, Lord, as your children to come before you and to think about what it means to worship you now here as a church and what it will mean to worship you in the coming kingdom. And so, Lord, we just want to pray Psalm 24 uh, back to you as an expression of our, of, our, uh, of our awe and our adoration and our desire to see you glorified. The, the earth is yours and all it contains, the world and all those who dwell in it, because you have founded it upon the seas and you established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into your hill? Who may stand in your holy place. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, he who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, has not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from you and righteousness from you, the God of our salvation. This is the generation of those who seek you, who seek your face, even Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? It is you, Yahweh, Lord of hosts. You are the King of glory. Lord, this is our prayer, and we pray this for your glory, for the glory of your son, Jesus Christ, when he comes back with your angels to establish a kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Grab your Bibles and open up to the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. We're, we're going to finish, Lord willing, we'll finish this story about the parables, the mysteries of the kingdom. It started in chapter 4, verse 1, and it goes all the way through chapter 4, verse 34, and we've been studying this for, for several weeks. This morning, I want to look at verses 30 to 34, and it contains the final parable that Mark records, namely the parable of the mustard seed. And before we dive in and look at that, I want to just begin with kind of a meditation, kind of a thought thinking about what would be different if we did not believe the parable of the mustard seed. What would change? What would be different about our Christian walk, our Christian life? What would be different about how we do church, how we do kingdom work? What would change? What would be different if we missed the point? If we misunderstand the nature of this parable, we would misunderstand the nature of kingdom work, and we could very easily squander our sacrifices on building a man-made kingdom instead of laboring for a self-building kingdom. We could find ourselves making kind of the paper mache pinata version of the kingdom, when, when Christ actually comes to establish a real one, a living one, a glorious one, full of righteousness that's supernatural and undeniable. And then there we are creating our paper mache version. Now, oh, see, we're bringing in the kingdom. We, um, we would be caught red handed when he comes to inaugurate his kingdom on earth if our efforts were squandered and 
wasted, poured out vainly as we were trying to build a kingdom of our own making, a kingdom designed by us, a kingdom, no matter what you might want it to look like when it's all said and done, a kingdom built by means that the world has at its disposal. Listen, if, if we're supposed to be part of kingdom work, it had better be a divine kingdom. It had better be a kingdom ruled by Christ. It had better be a kingdom with actual righteousness. It better not be a kingdom that is temporal. It better not be a kingdom built with the means of men and the means of politics and the means of human strength. It better be supernatural. Perhaps we should remind ourselves of the, the unsinkable Titanic. It was man-made. God can't sink the Titanic. And similarly, I think we're pouring, we, not this church, by God's grace, but too much that's happening in the name of kingdom building in this country is pouring efforts into a man-made kingdom that's about as useful as polishing the brass on the Titanic after it struck the iceberg. It's time for the church in prospering free countries to consider, once again, the parable of the mustard seed. It's very similar to the parable of the sleeping farmer that we looked at last time. It's uh, another parable about the seed, but this has a different emphasis. And so if, if, if we can, I want to go back very briefly, very quickly, and I want to look at the uh, read the verses 26 to 29, which we looked at last time, so that this is fresh in your mind. Here's, this, here's this, the parable we looked at last time, the parable of the sleeping farmer, or better, the parable of the self-growing seed. And Jesus was saying in verse 26, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts his seed upon the soil, and he goes to bed at night and gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself doesn't know. The soil produces crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Now, this is a parable. Obviously, it's about the seed. And as Jesus explained all the way back in um, verse 14, the sower sows the word. So to understand any of these parables, we have to remember that the seed is the word, the word of Christ, the word of the kingdom. It's the message of truth. It's the message of the gospel. It's what we have in scripture. It's the message of the word. And that's being sown. So it's broadcast. It's being spread. It's the articulation and the living out of the scripture that is sowing the seed. And what's interesting about the, so, the sleeping farmer is the emphasis here is on the fact that the, the farmer plays a role, but he is not causative in the growth. He simply sows seed, he goes to sleep, and he stands by. <laughs> Kingdom grows itself. It's self-building. It takes care of itself. And now, the emphasis in the mustard seed is, if you will, it turns and says, well, what do we do while we're sleeping? What does it look like? To, is there, is there any, any responsibility? Uh, it, how does this connect to the full-grown, full version of the kingdom? And so he gives us a parable that emphasizes this human role. Verse 30 and he said, how shall we picture the kingdom of God, or by what parable shall we present it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the soil, though it is smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. With many such parables, he was speaking the word to them so far as they were able to hear it. And he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. We need to learn and benefit from these mysteries of the kingdom. That's, again, that's what Jesus calls them in chapter 4, verse 11. He was saying to the disciples privately, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, they get everything in parables. And so the parables were concealing, for some, it was concealing the mysteries of the kingdom. Mysteries are 
uh, not unsolved, they're previously unrevealed. They're secrets, things that haven't been said yet, the truths about the kingdom that weren't revealed in the Old Testament. And so here we are getting another access to previously unrevealed secret or a mystery about the kingdom. And so here's our outline for this morning. A previously unrevealed secret of the kingdom. Number one, it starts out small. Number two, then it becomes big. You like that? Pretty simple. And actually grammatically incorrect because I just said there's one secret and there's two points. Why is there one secret and two points? Well, because one of those points wasn't a mystery. Number two was in the Old Testament. Number one is brand new. That's what Jesus is teaching for the first time. We're hearing new revelation about the kingdom in number one. It starts small. You'll look in vain in the Old Testament for what it looks like for there to be some sort of kingdom without Christ, because it's not there. There is no kingdom without Christ. Then the king shows up, both Matthew and Mark document Christ touching down on earth as man, reversing the curse in his local ministry, showing dominion over Satan and his demons, overturning the curse in the form of sin, in the form of disease, sickness, and even death, raising the dead. And yet he's largely rejected. His rejection is documented in Matthew chapters 8 through 12, and then comes Matthew 13, the parables of the kingdom. Mark, in a little bit of a different fashion, documents the unbelief of the religious leaders very specially in chapters 2 through 3, 6. From 3, 7 up until where we're studying, he's documenting the unbelief of the people. The king has shown up in the promised land, and he was rejected. And as a result of that rejection, he begins speaking in parables concealing truths and revealing things that weren't revealed before. Suddenly, he starts speaking like this about a new reality that not only has ever, nobody ever understood before because they've missed it, just, this has never been spoken before. Newly revealed realities. It starts small. So this is the, the, the mystery. The mystery is particularly in verses 30 and 31, by the time you get to verse 32, it's clearly not mystery anymore because he's actually quoting from the Old Testament. So verse 32 is by definition not a mystery. He's just showing how we're going to get to the promised version of the kingdom, and it's going to look in a way different than you could have ever imagined from previous prophecy. So verses 30 and 31 particularly are the mystery, and that's what I titled, It Starts Small. By the way, I was doing some more work on the idea of mystery, and I was, I was bouncing this around this week, and I came across an interesting article on rabbinical teaching. And the, the rabbis, the Jewish rabbis in Jesus' time, they, had, they, had a, they talked a lot about mystery. Um, mystery was just a regular part of their instruction. And I, I, read some, um, I read some debates between some famous rabbis. That's kind of what I do when I'm bored with my time is I read fam debates of famous rabbis. So you don't have to. Okay, you can thank me later. So here I, I came across this interesting, interesting article, and it was uh, written by a couple uh, German scholars who were walking through what's tr typically referred to as a mystery in Jewish argument, in rabbinical oral conversation. And so the rabbis would bounce this around and one of the most fundamental issues when it comes to mystery is that Israel was entrusted with the law and particularly the rabbinical interpretation of the law is the mystery. So in this view, according to the, the Jews, they would have a view of mystery that is, well, it's, it's previously unrevealed. It's a secret because we're the only ones who know it. The rabbis have the interpretive key to understand what God said in his word. So what it meant, we'll tell you what it meant. We hold that key, we hold that secret, or we hold the, the, the way to unlock the mystery of those truths. And that was, that's the first and foremost use of mystery among these rabbis. 
It was interesting because I came across this uh, discussion where it's also used of the advent of the Messiah's day. And I came across, here's, here's how the conversation goes. Isaac and Jacob both wanted the mystery of God to be revealed. Of Isaac, it is written, he called for his older son Esau in Genesis 27. He wanted to reveal the end to him, specifically the beginning of the messianic age, but God hid it from him. Jacob wanted to reveal it to his son because it says, and Jacob called his son, Genesis 49, 1. Don't think too hard about how they got to that conclusion. That's just simply what they said. Don't, don't overthink it. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. But it's interesting hearing mystery is something previously unrevealed. Either we hold the keys and tell you what truth means, or it's something that just hasn't, God hasn't told us, like the beginning of the messianic age. Well, before we dive into the parable of the mustard seed, let me give you some examples in the New Testament of what a mystery actually is. There's three classic texts. There's, there's, there's more, but these are the classic ones that we can't ignore. Let's start in Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. There's a a uh, very famous mystery passage, and I would encourage you to go back and listen to Smed's sermon on that from Romans 16 last year. But you remember how Paul ends his letter? He ends the epistle to the, to the Romans here in this way, verses 25 to 27, the last three verses of the letter. And now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel... And the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past. Notice he uses the word mystery, same word here. So uh, again, don't think of a problem to be solved, a mystery, a crime to be uh, resolved. Think of a, a, a revelation, a previously unrevealed truth. It's a mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested um, and by the scriptures, and by the way, this, this, is, this starts to get a little bit challenging. Some people think it's not a mystery because it's in the writing of the prophets in the Old Testament, but that's actually not a, the best translation here. The word is not the writing of the prophets. The original literally says the prophetic scriptures. It's talking about recently given apostolic writings that are prophetic in their nature. So that's the mystery. God has these truths. Now, a lot of truth is revealed in the Old Testament. A lot of truth. There is a tremendous amount of truth in the Old Testament. And then comes the New Testament, and it says a lot of the same things. And it also adds new truths. And so those new truths are mysteries. Well, what specifically is Paul talking about here? But now this mystery, verse 26, is manifested and by the scriptures, literally the prophetic scriptures, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You have Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, now taking special revelation to the nations. So we think of missions, and we're very used to missions being the Great Commission, outward arrows, leaving home, taking the gospel to people who haven't heard. That's what Paul's saying is the mystery, because up until the church age, the Great Commission would have been arrows coming in. It would have been the nations coming to Israel, Israel being so devoutly committed to God that God was reigning over them with such righteousness and with such blessing that all the nations looked in on them and were jealous, saying, I wish Yahweh ruled us. And so the Great Commission would have gone inward, and now in the church age, mystery it's going out to the nations. Let's look at the next one, Ephesians chapter 3. Again, we're just looking at some of the, the really important contributions to our understanding of mystery. Ephesians 3, Paul is uh, writing to the Ephesians, and he says this about the mystery. Pick it up in verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul... The prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery. So the only reason he knows this, I mean, Paul knows just, he, he, knows, he knows what we know from the Old Testament. He has access to the Old Testament. We have access to the Old Testament. This is a mystery. The only reason he knows it is because God revealed it directly to him. That's why he's an apostle. As I wrote before in brief, verse 4, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight 
into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, oh, whoa, whoa, he's about to give it. Just lay it out. What's the mystery? Verse 6, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That's a mystery. He's like, wait a minute. Gentiles being saved? No, no, no. Gentiles are saved in the Old Testament. You can read that. You can see that all over the place. The rabble coming up from Egypt, coming out of Egypt. Those were Gentiles who were converted, who were circumcised of heart. And their conversion became proselytism to Israel, to Judaism, Christ-centered Judaism. How about the sailors and Jonah? They fear God and start offering sacrifices to Yahweh. Gentile conversion is not new. That's not a mystery. Gentile salvation on equal footing in their Gentile state is a mystery. And so, Paul says in verse 7, Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. And to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. So therefore, I don't ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are for your glory." That's what he says to Gentiles. And that is profound to think of the glory of God being put on display to demonic hordes who are laughing at what they might have thought was a successful turning of Israel from responding positively to Christ only to see God working redemptive purposes through the nations to the Gentiles in order to make Israel jealous. That's a mystery. Last one, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Paul talks about mystery one more time here. And uh, let's pick it up in verse 20. Well, let's, let's just start in verse 24. We'll start at the beginning of this paragraph. Paul writes this, Colossians 1, 24. Now, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. And I don't have... Uh, time to get totally distracted with that, but since that is, it might raise a question in your mind. The only thing is, there's nothing lacking in his afflictions for atonement. The only thing that's lacking is the personal presentation of that suffering in a suffering articulation of the gospel through an evangelist, and that's what Paul's fulfilling. Verse 25, of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is, the mystery, which has been hidden from past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's, there's the mystery. Christ indwelling individuals? No. Christ indwelling individuals through his spirit? No. Christ indwelling Gentiles? Yeah. I can prove those other doctrines from the prophecy of Isaiah. This is mystery. Wow. So just to step back and appreciate, man, what Christ is doing here is he's, he's starting with a previously revealed truth about the kingdom. Here's this glorious kingdom you've already known about, but let me give you a mystery. Let me show you now in light of my rejection what it's going to look like to get to this kingdom. This was not revealed before. So let's go back to Mark chapter 4, and we're ready to look at this, the mystery aspect, which is it, it starts small. Mark chapter 4, verse 30, and he said, how shall we picture the, picture the kingdom of God, or by what parable shall we present it with? And this is, you know, the most parabolic introduction to all the parables. What, what word picture should I use? What comparison should I make? And so he's thinking about communicating this mystery of the kingdom, and he's looking for a word picture. And so he comes up with the mustard seed. 
What's interesting about this is that he, obviously Christ knows where he's going, because in verse 32, he's going to use the picture of a tree, and the picture of the tree is already messianic, and it's already a picture of the kingdom. And so he's using the seed analogy to go back to the immature growth of this plant before it becomes a full-grown tree. So he sticks with the seed analogy, but he specifically uses a mustard seed. So we're not sowing wheat, we're not sowing corn, we're not sowing milo, sorghum, rye, and pick your grain of choice. This is a mustard seed. It's tiny. Verse 31, and it's, it's like the mustard seed, which when it was sown upon the soil, it's, it's smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil. A mustard seed is about the size of a grain of sand. And sure, as you all know, it's common knowledge that the epiphytic orchids that grow in tropical rainforests have a seed that is one three hundredth of an inch long. And that kind of common knowledge causes everybody to say, is this really the smallest seed? Um, Yes, it's the smallest seed. Jesus is talking to farmers in Israel, and it's an agricultural context in the context of sowing. Um, I, I, as far as I'm aware, I don't, I don't know that anybody in the native rainforest even sow orchids. But nevertheless, there's no threat here. It's the smallest seed in Israel of plants that you would plant. It's used uh, in the Jewish um, arguments, like in the Mishnah, for example, when they argue about how much of a, how much of a, a quantity would make something unclean, uh, there's an argument about if a vessel is made unclean by the f- liquid or by the solids, and they're arguing, no, 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 it's just it's the food. No, 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 it's, just, it's only the liquids. No, it's food and liquids. And, and so then they have this argument, and it's like if the liquid combines with solid flour enough to make dough even the size of a mustard seed, the whole dish is unclean. And so when they have to pick the smallest amount that they knew of, they used the mustard seed as the comparison. And that's Jesus' point. He uses the smallest, smallest item that you could possibly use. And he point, paints a picture here that the focus in this parable is on the casting of seeds being something small, unnoticed. It's not notable. It's not obvious to the world. It's not globally visible, globally recognizable. Think about it for a second. Christ says that when he comes back, it's going to be like lightning from the east to the west. It's going to be a supernatural phenomenon that no one in that day is arguing about what's it look like to be in the kingdom. Those arguments end because it's obvious this is it. But in light of his rejection, here's the king on earth being rejected by his own people. And some believe, the insiders are believing. So he starts speaking to them in parables and says, let me tell you a secret. Yeah, everything that you already know about the kingdom is still true. Nothing's changed. But in addition to that, you know what's going to happen? Is there's going to be a period there of, it's like mustard seed stage. So before the kingdom comes, as you, as you see it prophesied in the Old Testament, that's still true. But how are you going to get there? Sowing seed. Remember, the seed, verse 14, is the word. The seed is the word. It's the gospel. It's preaching of the truth. It's the living word of God, the revelation of God's character. It's an infallible document testifying to the heart and mind of our God. And this is what must be sown before the kingdom comes. The seed is not political advancement, legislative improvement, increasing of the economy, man-made means of increasing human flourishing, It is preaching the word. That's what the church does. That's what it's supposed to be doing. That's our mission is sowing the seed. That's it. There's nothing else in this parable. The focus is once again on the seed. And in contrast to the self 
to the sleeping farmer where, where he has this self-growing seed, which is kind of likened to our self-building kingdom. The, the focus of, of the seed is actually on the sowing of that seed in this parable, in the parable of the mustard seed. The idea is that until Christ comes, until the kingdom is established in a full tree, when Christ actually reigns on earth in human form and he reverses the curse and puts to death all of his enemies, the last enemy being death, until we see the arrival of the kingdom described in the Old Testament, what you're going to see is a period of mustard seed, mustard seed smallness. And by the way, this first point about it starting small and even all the ideas of all the parables about the mysteries, these mysteries do not reinterpret the, old, the, the previous revelation. They don't rewrite the previous interpretation. They don't tell us, oh, you know what it sounded like or what Zechariah said, it just, he got it wrong or Isaiah was kind of stuttering, he, just didn't, he wasn't clear. So here's what I meant to say, what my father meant to say the first time he spoke. None of that. It's all valid. It's all true. Nothing's changed. But in addition to that, in addition to that, until the kingdom comes in that form, be content to sow small seed. It starts small, and then it becomes big, verse 32. Yet when it is sown... It grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. A mustard tree or plant slash bush, people don't even know, there's debates about what you call it because it's, it's, it's obviously a garden herb and it, it is pretty bushy. Um, it grows to 15 feet high. And so it's not inaccurate to call it either a bush or a tree. Uh, because it's a small tree, large bush. <laughs> and it clearly could hold a lot of birds. My wife um, used to grow uh, dill and oregano and all sorts of herbs, and they would be in a little pot, and the pot was about uh, maybe 16 inches tall. And they would never grow more than a, a foot or two. And that's it. You put that next to a mustard tree, it's like not even comparable, the, the size. I mean, this dwarfs all other garden vegetables or garden herbs. It says garden plants in the NES. Maybe even garden herbs is a more literal translation of, of the original. And to prove the point, as I already mentioned, that this is not a mystery, Jesus says it becomes larger than all the other plants and forms large branches, and then he just flat out gets after it and says, so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. Okay, and we need to take a brief pause in Mark 4, and we need to look at that phrase. That phrase shows up at least four times in the Old Testament. And it shows up of, a, of several different nations. Let me, let's start in Ezekiel 31. Ezekiel 31. Just turn to Ezekiel for a second. And this is talking about, um, in verse 6, we find the phrase, all the birds of the heavens nested in its boughs. And so we got to figure out what branches, what tree, who, who's the referent here? What nation is the referent? And so when you go back to um, the beginning of the chapter here, it says that this is the word of the Lord. And it's from Ezekiel, through Ezekiel 2, verse 2, the, the Pharaoh of Egypt say to him, whom are your greatness? Behold, Assyria was a, a, a cedar in Lebanon with beautiful branches uh, forest shade, very high. Its top was among the clouds. Um, and he goes on to describe Assyria to the nation of Egypt. So this reference to this tree is God speaking to Egypt about Assyria, saying, consider Assyria. Consider how powerful it was. Consider how massive it was. Consider that it was a world superpower. And so when it talks about all the birds of heaven nesting in its branches, it's talking about all the nations, six C. All nations lived under its shade. In other words, Assyria was such a powerful nation, such a powerful kingdom, that all the other human powers benefited from its strength and from its economy, from its protection. That's powerful. That's really powerful. It's a global superpower. Speaking of Assyria. Now, look at Daniel for a second. And uh, Smed, Smed's been doing an 
incredible job in Daniel. It's been so awesome. We, it, a couple months ago, he was in Daniel 4, and I want to show you that prophecy in Daniel 4. Because here it's referring to um, Babylon, and specifically Nebuchadnezzar ruling over Babylon, and the, the words used in Daniel's prophecy here, in the dream, as, he, as he recounts the dream, and then as he interprets it for, for Babylon, is this same language. So um, let's pick it up in verse 12. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar describes this vision that he saw, and he says, its foliage, and there's this tree, verse 11, the tree grew large, its height reached to the sky, it was visible to the ends of the whole earth, verse 12, its foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches, and all the living creatures fed themselves from it. What's that all about? Skip down to verse 20 and 21. Daniel explains. Verse 20, the tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky and was visible to all the earth, and whose foliage was beautiful and whose, its fruit abundant, and in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and all, I'm sorry, and in whose branches the, the birds of the sky lodged. It's you, O king, verse 22, for you have become great and, re- and grown strong, and your majesty has become great and reached to the sky and your dominion to the end of the earth. This is a kingdom of global dominion. He's been given supremacy from a human standpoint as the greatest human superpower of his day. And so the picture is of a great tree that casts shade for all the nations and the birds can dwell in its branches. So that, that word picture has been used in Ezekiel 31 of Assyria. It's been used in Daniel 4 of Babylon. Let me show you one more example. We'll go back to Ezekiel for a second. Ezekiel chapter 17. Here, interestingly, it's used of Israel. The same word picture is used of Israel, but it's not an Israel of Ezekiel's day. It's an Israel of a future day, namely an Israel under the Messiah. In the beginning of this chapter, he's talking about um, God's judgment on the nation, and he's talking about how he's going to use um, Egypt and um, he's even going to use Egypt for, to accomplish his means, and then he's going to snuff Egypt out. And so he, he, he says in um, um, verse 20, I will spread my net over him. He will be caught in my snare. Then I will bring him to Babylon. I'm sorry, that's not Egypt. That's the uh, king of Israel who uh, looked to Egypt for his support. He didn't trust the Lord. He looked to Egypt. So I'm going to bring him to Babylon and enter into judgment with him there regarding the unfaithful act which he has committed against me. All the choice men, verse 21, and all his troops will fall by the sword, and the survivors will be scattered to every wind, and you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. Thus says the Lord God, I will also take a sprig, think of a little branch, a little shoot, a sprig from the lofty top of the, the cedar, and set it out. I will pluck from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one, and I will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. He's taking a tender shoot, a tender branch, and it's like, it's like cutting it off to engraft it into another plant. Just picture a little cutting from a small plant, and it's just tender, it's, 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 it's delicate, and God is committed to using this tender shoot to do something. Verse 23, on the high mountain of Israel, I will plant it, that it may bring forth boughs and bear fruit and become a stately cedar. And birds of every kind will nest under it. They will nest in the shade of its branches, All the trees of the field will know that I am the Lord. I will bring down the high tree, exalt the low tree, dry up the green tree, make the green, the dry tree flourish. I'm the Lord. I've spoken. I will perform it. That's the Messiah. That's the righteous branch. He's the young shoot, Isaiah 11. He's a righteous branch, Zechariah 6. He's a righteous branch, Jeremiah 23. This is the day of Messiah, and he's likened to a tiny little sapling planted on a mountain, and it becomes an incredible tree that becomes global. It has total dominion, and all the human nations flourish under the reign of this sprig from this cedar tree. So, you go back to Mark chapter 4, in our parable, it becomes very clear. Look, before that day comes that you already know about, it's going to take a long, slow process of my people sowing seed. And then, 
as people hear the word, as people believe the word, is there kingdom work happening now? Well, sure. If you want to call kingdom work the God's creation of new kingdom citizens, the spread of the kingdom because people are believing the truth, trusting their lives to the king who will come, that's kingdom work now. What's not secret is this second point, it becomes big, and when Christ comes back, it is going to be global, and it is going to be total dominion, and all the nations of the earth will uh, blossom and flourish and benefit militarily, economically, medically, in every way imaginable. And then he goes on to say, with many such parables, he was speaking the word to them so far as they were able to hear it. He was speaking in a way that was gauged to their listening ability. And verse 34 says, and he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. And imagine how how impossible it would be to understand these parables without the explanation of the seed is the word. And that's critical to understand all of this. I want to ask you, first of all, are you committed and convinced to the fact that Christ is coming back? Christ is coming back. He's going to reign. He's going to reign on this earth, the cursed version of it. And he's going to show forth a a display of righteousness, of such an incredible, blessed righteousness that Jeremiah prophesies the nations will see and they will be jealous. Outside the borders of Israel, nations would be peeking over. Man, if only we could have Christ as our dictator. Global, righteous, the curse being reversed. When he establishes a kingdom, there's going to be a harvest. And on the day of harvest, Christ is going to remove all his enemies. The only people who are in the kingdom are his sheep. Are you committed to that reality? Christian, are you living in light of that reality? Does it affect how you live? It has to affect how we live. And this becomes the question, the real benefit of the parable of the mustard seed is thinking about the fact that we are in this time between Christ's coming, a mysterious time from the vantage point of the Old Testament that wasn't known. Uh, and, And here we are still awaiting the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies of this kingdom that's coming. And yet our current kingdom work had better be to be devoted to the seed that grows itself. It's a self growing seed. It's all powerful because it's God's word. We need to be committed to that. Right now, we have too many who are being committed to kingdom work of a different variety. We have people who are committed to a kingdom work that is a a work that Christ hasn't called us to do. We have people who are highlighting the fact that, hey, the kingdom's now. We need to be building a kingdom here and now. Well, if you're going to build a kingdom now, what kingdom are you going to build? If you mean by building a kingdom, preaching the word of God, amen, that's Christ's point. But if you mean building a kingdom that means making America a better place for the next generation, I'm all for that. I'm a dad of four. But that's not the gospel. That's not the Great Commission. And by all means, be a faithful American citizen But do not get distracted from being a faithful Christian. Churches are getting distracted from the Great Commission to do kingdom work, the kind of work that is nothing more than mere human power, the kind of work of cleaning up the streets and trying to eradicate poverty and trying to train people with better jobs. And those things are great. Those things are fine. There's nothing wrong with those things. But when that becomes the gospel commission, then the true gospel gets left behind. (laughs) I appreciate that. That's where I've been living for the last 10 years. I've tried to interact with folks who are telling us, hey, we've got to be about 
doing kingdom work, making America a better place, increasing human flourishing. No, we need to be about the gospel. We need to be about the word of God. We do not want to be caught red-handed being devoted to really doing what the world without the Holy Spirit, the world without the gospel, the world by means of common grace can do on its own. We want to be devoted to doing what God alone can do through people who are his own children, possessed by the Holy Spirit, something supernatural, namely preaching the gospel. There's a few texts that I want to just highlight here. We've got a few minutes. I just want to highlight a couple texts here that people will often point to as evidence that the kingdom is now. Let's look at uh, Luke chapter 17 for a second. Luke 17. And this is um, often, I remember as a young Christian, people would take me to this passage to tell me that the kingdom is now. Luke 17 um, Verses 20 and 21, this is right after he, the, he heals the 10 lepers. Only one comes back to thank him and give glory to God. And he says to that one of, of all the 10, they were all healed, but only one, he says, your faith has made you well. And so now, I mean, this is in the middle. This is right after, right on the heels of Christ showing kingdom power in his authority over disease. He is reversing the curse right there in front of them. And verse 20. Now, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. And people stop right there and they say, yeah, see, it's internal. It's, in, it's, in, it's within you. It's just this internal reality. Well, that doesn't really work because if it's an issue of just Christ ruling the heart that was true of every regenerate saint in the Old Testament as well. What's he saying here? He's saying to a group of unbelievers, the religious leaders of the nation, look, the king has shown up in the kingdom and he's reversing the curse. I'm fulfilling all the prophecies that were given about me and you're still rejecting me. There's no other sign for you. What sign is there? You're rejecting truth. You're rejecting prophecy. You're rejecting its fulfillment in me. Continue reading. Verse 22, he was saying to the disciples, the days will come when you will long to see one of the days of Son of Man, and you will not see it. They will say to you, look here, look there. Don't, don't, do not go away. Do not run after them. For just like the lightning when it flashes out of one part of the sky shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. It's going to be globally visible, and no one will be questioning when he actually comes. But because you rejected me, I'm going to leave, and people are going to keep saying, hey, here it is, here's the kingdom, here's the kingdom, here's the kingdom, here's kingdom now, kingdom now, kingdom now. No wonder we hear so much kingdom now, because Jesus said people are going to be saying kingdom now. <laughs> what did he say? It's Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, let's pick it up in verse 11. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and they supposed, look at this, the disciples are, we're supposing that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return, and he called 10 of his slaves and he gave them, and he goes on to describe this parable where he gives responsibility of the kingdom to a bunch of servants. But he, the king, actually leaves to go prepare a kingdom for himself. He tells this whole parable because he wanted them to be disabused of the confusion that the kingdom was going to appear immediately. Look at Acts chapter 1. In the, after Jesus' resurrection, he gives a 40-day uh, seminar to the disciples. And man, I, would have, I don't know what the audit fee would have been for that class. Man, I, I just, every time I read Acts 1, I'm like, oh, I just wish, I mean, Luke, just tell us what, give us the syllabus for that 40-day seminar. I mean, that's incredible. For 40 days, he's talking to them about the kingdom. Verse, verse um, 3, to these, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. I mean, this is post-resurrection seminar on the kingdom of God. Verse 4, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
And remember that. Don't, don't lose sight of the fact that he said, not many days from now, you're getting the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Wait a minute. What about this whole kingdom now thing? I mean, he's been talking about the kingdom for 40 days, and they're like, oh, is it now you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Here's his answer. You idiots, you missed the whole point of the seminar. No, that's not the, that's not the response. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the epics which the Father has fixed by his own authority. They weren't wrong in their notion of kingdom. They were wrong in thinking that they were supposed to know the timing of the kingdom. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. You're not supposed to know the timing of the kingdom. You are supposed to know that you're getting the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And until I return, you get busy by the power of the Holy Spirit preaching the gospel to the nations. You know, sowing mustard seed. Sowing mustard seed. Listen. I'm so thrilled that this church is grounded in truth. I'm so thrilled that this church is confident in the power of the word of God. And I just was thinking about this parable of the mustard seed all week. Thinking about how I can encourage you. And I just want to say... I mean, if we were playing fantasy church, we were kind of creating, you know, fantasy ministry here. Like, how are we going to do ministry? How are we going to do this until Christ comes back? I would say this. I would say, give me one small church of Christians committed to the self-building power of the word of God over an entire nation of individuals who are self-initiated and have all sorts of power to take over publishing centers, to take over the arts, to take over movies, to take over politics, to take over Washington, and to change the, 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 the culture and to increase the economy and to make the world a better place. Is that wrong? No, unless it distracts from the gospel. And why is it that every single time Christian movements start going down the road of the cultural mandate and increasing human flourishing, why is it they, they always say you do that and the gospel, but one of them gets left behind? I'll tell you exactly why. Because Christ said, how they treat you is how they treat me. And if you have a twofold mission, and the mission is cultural. You make the world a better place. The world loves that. And it's also gospel. You're a sinner. And your only hope is a crucified Messiah to die in your place and to cover your, your guilt for your sins. They hate that. You want to increase your profile in the public square? Go with this one, not that one. You want a more comfortable life? Go with this one, not that one. Why is it that those two, the cultural and the gospel mandate, the so-called cultural mandate and this gospel mandate that Christ actually gave us, why are they not able to be held with balance in both hands? Because this one can be accomplished by people without the Holy Spirit and without the gospel. And when you join them on their turf, they'll pat you on the back and applaud you all day long. But when you're faithful to this one, the world will hate you. And we do not want to be caught with our hands in the cookie jar doing what the world can do on its own. Let's get busy doing what Christ called us to do. Amen. Father, thank you so much for this mustard seed principle. And I just pray that it would be a protection for us as a church, a protection for your people, because Lord, there's so many gifted and devoted saints. And you've given them such incredible drive and passions. And I want all of those gifts and drives and initiatives to be poured out faithfully under your commission, the Great Commission. We want to preach and proclaim. We have, every, we have rights as Christians, namely the right to believe and the right to suffer, and I pray that we would hang on to those rights. And uh, whatever rights we have as Americans, we want to thank you for. But I, do, I pray that we would not get distracted from the rights as a Christian to believe and suffer for your, for your name. In your name we pray. Amen.